Now, if you want a title for tonight's message, you can choose one of two titles. The first title, they're both very profound. The first title is, hang on, we'll find it before I get talking about it. Life Beyond the Veil, Into the Throne Room. Or you can just go Beyond the Veil and Into the Throne Room. Yep, that's probably the best one to go with. <laughs> Won't confuse you with two titles, hey? I just want to actually share some testimonies before I get stuck into talking. Do you want to come up? Who, who was I talking to? Which one? Both of us, both of <laughs> Now you've heard of translocating, but bilocating is when you double and split in half. It's amazingly miracle. I don't know which one. Yeah, I'm Cameron. I'm Cameron. I'm Cameron. Victoria. We're always saying that with wins. You're my guest. Yes. So, uh, you want to be sure? Yep. Um, what, why are you brimming with excitement, enthusiasm, and living yeah. on the edge of revival? Tell me, uh, why? That, why is that? Uh, even today, I was on the phone with some people, some prophetic friends, and they're saying that God is really going to move here in Corby, and we sense tonight that that's going to be very significant. Uh, Dave, do you want to share what you're sensing? Do you feel yeah. Um, so I'm excited to be here. This this whole weekend for me feels like, uh, like just falling falling in love with God all along. Yeah. It's just like yeah. like a romance. And uh, in fact, I I booked into the Kingfisher, and, and the only room left was was called the romance room. And I walked in a little awkward <laughs> being in there, you know, just by myself. And I just see guy, but but no, I learned to no, know this is. This is a theme for this weekend, you know. So I, I'm I'm falling in love with God all yeah. over me. Yeah. Yeah. And my my heart's desire is to see a true historical revival break out, you know, and go around the world globally. Yeah. And I uh, just feel like I, I, I you know I've traveled many places in the world. Where there's been a move of God, and you know they always call me by when it first starts, and, and you just watch and see what happens. I've been in places where I've seen really amazing miracles, um, healing miracles, but I sense that you know God is going to do something here in court, and I can feel this in my spirit because because I've gone to so many places, you can you can feel it like we would measure the anointing. And the move of God, but how far away we were as we traveled to it. How far away were we when we could feel the anointing? When I flew into Port Hardy, I was flying over top of Port McNeil when I could feel the anointing coming out of Port Hardy. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I was in the night room of God in the States, and um, you, you could feel that from about 20 miles away. You could feel the anointing. And uh, so as I prepared to fly down here, um, I'd, I'd spent the day just waiting on God and, and in my house in Fort St. John. And when it was time to, to drive to the airport, I actually live outside of Fort St. John, I live at Charter Lake. And when, I, when I, I walked out of my house, got in my truck, and I started driving, I, I was beginning the, the, the journey to come here, and that's 800 miles away. And that's when I, when the anointing started to yeah. yeah. So that that's a measure of, of the level of anointing that God is going to release here tonight. So it, the, the, let your faith just go through the roof because God can do anything tonight. We're, we're going to see miracles, and every indication that I see in the Spirit is this is going to be really big, really big. So. Yeah, I just think it's interesting. I have uh, four friends here, or three friends. So, Ken from Fort St. John, Marvin from Manitoba, and Matthew from Australia, and I'm from Victoria. But I just feel like uh, heaven wants to see healings here tonight, and we want to see healings. We just want to partner with heaven. God is not setting any limits. We want to ensure that we're 
we're open to everything the Lord wants to do, that we're not setting any limits. So I think you've got a scripture, it's First Chronicles 22, verse 16. It says, of gold and silver, bronze and iron, there is no limit. This is, this is the word of the Lord. There is no limit. The Lord is telling us there is no limit. So Father, I just pray that for each of us here that we would not set any limits on what you want to do tonight, Lord. That we would not set any limits on your glory. Father, that we would be hungry tonight. That we would be desperate for you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Everything you want to do tonight, Lord. Everything that's on your heart for tonight, Lord. We just say yes. We say yes. We say yes. Lord, we ask for your Holy Spirit here. We ask for your angels here. We ask for your angels here to be ministering. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. you want to share some of the miracles and things you've seen? <laughs> I, I went this morning to uh, get, get my eyes checked. And uh, that's been two years. And I'm talking to the optometrist. I'm saying, hey, you know, there's a guy that was at a a church meeting recently in Victoria, and he's medically blind where he was. Like he went to the meeting, couldn't see anything, couldn't see any light, totally blind. And I said to the optometrist, I said, people prayed for him at the meeting, and he left being able to see it. And at the meeting, he could see a bit of light, and then he could see faces. And so I said to her, is this, you know, asked her what she thought of that, and she, and she was, she was, she said, well, this, this is what God's doing. I've never heard of a healing of, of eyes on the island. Like God is doing a new thing right now. There's cancer is being healed. <clears throat> you see, like there's, a, there's an opportunity. There's doors that were closed in the past that are now open. Hello, hello. I did actually forget to share one little thing. It's a little bit super spiritual, so just bear with me. Sometimes I share super spiritual stories. <laughs> And people with highly developed unbelief go, come on, that's a bit far-fetched, buddy. I don't know if that really happened. And that's a product of living in a culture of highly developed unbelief. Bill Johnson's quite funny. He talks about the scripture where the people of Jesus' town had no, no belief, had unbelief. And he says to his people in Bethel, he says, we are almost at the faith level of the people in Jesus' own town. <laughs> We're starting to see small miracles. And he's like going, let's be realistic, that's where our faith is at, it's below Jesus' hometown. If we can get our faith to above his hometown, well wow, that's when the blind see, that's when you know, things change. Now, what you can see in the natural is not always the most important thing, right? Right on. The Bible says everything that is unseen is eternal. We can't see angels and demons unless you've got some kind of special gift. We can't see the Holy Spirit moving right now. He's, it's happened before, but we can't see him right now. Everything that is unseen to your eyes is more important than every single thing you can see. Now, this is foundational, all right? I'm actually writing a book called The Invisible Kingdom. Because I've read the scriptures for many years, and it says the kingdom of heaven is like this, the kingdom of heaven is like that. You know, one scripture says the kingdom of heaven is like a dragon. Why is it like a dragon? Because he's talking about the kingdom of heaven on earth. He says, when you preach the gospel and you release the kingdom, it's going to sweep everybody into it. Now, some of those fish will be good fish, some will be bad fish. We'll work it out later. We'll throw out the bad fish and keep the good ones. So he's, he's explaining what the kingdom of heaven will be like when it invades earth. He's not constantly just talking about heaven in the sky. He's saying, yes, there's a heaven in the sky, and it's very important. Right? The Bible speaks very highly of how important it is. But he's saying, I really want it to be released through you. I mean, the title of last night's message was The Atmosphere of Heaven. Because revival needs the atmosphere of heaven. The atmosphere of earth will not help you if you want to see revival. I really like a quote from Leonard Raven Hill. He says, if you want to see revival, just get a piece of chalk, draw a circle on the ground, right? Now, he knows people can't really have the faith to believe in revival to sweep the entire nation. So he goes, let's make it something small, something realistic. All I want you to do is pray for revival to happen inside of the white circle. Can you believe faith for the two-foot circle to be filled with revival? People are like, yeah, that's manageable. I can imagine that. But I want you to stand inside the circle while you're praying. In other words, I want a revival to break out inside of you. 
Because guess what? If a revival breaks out inside of you, it's going to be released through you. Alright? There were some preachers like that were evangelists that started the revival and they said people would come to watch me burn. What did that mean? They meant the fire of the Holy Spirit was so hot inside of them, the flame was being fanned so hot to such a temperature spiritually that people were attracted to it, like moths are attracted to a light. People just were drawn to the flame because the flame gave off light, and in that light there was the light of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world and the salt of the earth. People go, yep, I can totally believe that. Do you believe that he said, you are the light of the world and you are the salt of the earth? Hmm. Well, that's hard to believe. Why am I the light of the world? That's strange. That's strange. Because God lives in you. The Holy Spirit lives in you. Right? Now, if he lives in you, then the same light he carried, you carry and the source of the light of any lamp is its flame. And the fire of the Holy Spirit can so fill you that you're going to give off light. What does Jesus promise to do if you're giving off his light? He promises not to leave you under the table where no one can see you. Some Christians say, why do I feel like I've been left under the table where no one can see me? And God's like, well, you're not giving off a lot of light, so I've just left <laughs> you down there. But I'll tell you what, if you get a little bit of oil and you just sort of sprinkle the oil onto the flame, the flame lights up. Now that sounds a bit out there, it's actually completely scriptural, because the word Christos in the Old Testament, anointing, means was actually meant oil. So when they poured out the oil onto the priests or whatever, David, it was Christos, they were anointed. Now Jesus was called the Christ, meaning like the fully anointed one. But instead of being anointed by oil, New Testament, you're anointed by a person, the Holy Spirit. So Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit. Now why does it pour the oil on the flame? It's because Old Testament it was oil. New Testament, the Holy Spirit's presence is the oil that replaces the physical oil. Now why I'm saying that's so important is because when you worship, you attract the presence of the Holy Spirit. Now when you attract the presence of the Holy Spirit, that is like oil. Your little fire gets fanned hotter. And guess what happens when your, your fire becomes hotter? It separates the wheat from the chaff, alright? It burns away the impurities inside of us, the flesh, right? If people are having like problems with, like, Leonard Ravenhill puts it this way. He says, Christianity is either superficial or it's supernatural. I'm convinced there's no middle ground. Now, he wasn't being harsh to conservative people, trying to pick on them. What he was saying is you're either filled with the Spirit and over, over brimming with signs and wonders and miracles and the presence of God. You're either that or you're operating in the flesh. And does the Bible teach us to operate in the flesh or the Spirit? Spirit. Did you know the most popular preachers in the whole world are the ones that appeal to the flesh? Because most people are walking in the flesh. And guess what? If you feed on people that will excite the flesh, like if I wanted to, I've been in sales for many years, I could excite people's greed and go, you can make a million dollars or ten billion dollars, and I could excite your greed in your heart, and that, that's what that's called. That's called the carnal flesh nature. Now, why as a preacher of God would I want the flesh nature to blossom in you? That's totally, totally ridiculous. That is fanning the flame of your carnal flesh with nature. There's, there is obviously blessings in God, financial blessings and everything. So I'm not, I'm not preaching a poverty gospel because I don't believe in poverty either. But prosperity in the original language of the Old Testament means nothing missing, nothing broken. It means fullness, completion, not brokenness. It doesn't mean multimillionaires with Ferraris and Lamborghinis. It means nothing missing, nothing broken. All right? So when people say, you know, a different version of the gospel, a different version is the same as the word perversion. Perversion is a parallel version of the truth. It's a perversion. So people go, do you believe in the prosperity gospel? The fact that it even has a different name is telling you that it's a different version of the true gospel. Right. Why should there be a different version of the true gospel? Right. Now I believe in blessing. If God turned around and gave you half a million dollars, I will rejoice with you and go, wow, God is amazing. God is a God of more than enough. I like telling real stories that happened recently, recently, rather than just looking for old stories all the time. One story, because God's um, blessing is not always in like 
financial, right? My mum's an artist, she paints flowers. If anyone's friends with me on Facebook, they'll see that these paintings are quite amazing. And uh, she's praying to God, and this is the kind of thing she'll pray. I really need this flower and this flower for, for my painting, right? So can you help me find this flower and this flower? Let's say it's a lilac and a cherry blossom, which it wasn't, but I can't remember what flower it was. Anyway, she's driving around and she's like, God, please help me find this flower, because if I can't find this flower, I can't create. And if I can't create, I can't make my painting. She comes across a field, as far as the eye can see, of nothing but those two flowers. The Spirit of God led her without even knowing it. Most of the time that you're led by the Holy Spirit, you don't find out until later. And you go, that was highly coincidental. <laughs> you know, coincidence is the language of the Holy Spirit. Okay, we can clap. <laughs> so what's happening on the earth right now is pretty exciting. God is raising up an entire army of people that hate man-made religion. They can't, in fact, they're so highly allergic to it they will literally cringe if it comes near them. I've got a friend that's so on fire for God. She walks into a church and feels like control and man-made religion. She goes, yuck, I can't even be in there. She leaves. This, this, this breed of people, they're all over the world. They're highly allergic to man-made control, manipulation, churchianity, which is exalting an institution above the name of Jesus. They don't, want, they don't want a hybrid of Christianity. They don't want churchianity. They don't want legalism. They don't want control. They don't want man-made agenda or financial agenda. They just want pure, raw worship. Yeah. Jesus said, Jesus said, my father is seeking worshippers in spirit and in truth. Now we have a generation rising up, and they're not all young people, they're different ages, but it's like this breed around the world, and in every country I meet them, and they're worshippers in spirit, and they're worshippers in truth. Amen. And they look and smell and taste like Jesus. They manifest the person of Jesus. And when you meet them, you look at them and you go, oh wow, you're so different from the other Christians. What, what is different about you? Why are you so different? Well, the thing is, they follow Jesus Christ. Right. They allow the image of Jesus Christ to be formed inside of them. I know people that actually say they can feel Christ being formed inside of them. Yeah. Wow. They can feel their nature giving way to the nature of Jesus. The bad habits in their life, or not, not even like the seriously bad habits, I mean just the, just the ways that we consider normal, right? start to shift, and your very appetite starts to change. I mean, some people used to listen to rock and roll and rap. You get saved, you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Have you ever wondered why you don't like worship, and then you do like worship, and then you love worship? Why? Because the Holy Spirit is at work inside of you, shifting you, molding you, transforming you, until, you, until you, the image of Christ is fully formed inside of you. What's the recipe for revival? Simple. Surrender to Jesus and allow the person of Jesus to manifest through you, so you don't just represent him, you're representing Christ. I talk too much and I don't breathe enough. <laughs> you still need to breathe. So my mum watched the video and she goes, Matt, you've got to stop and breathe, okay? You can't just keep talking. <laughs> So, every single thing you want, revival, healing, blessing, miracles, deliverance, prophetic, you name it, protection from the enemy, every single thing that you want is, a real, is, an, is an overflow of your intimacy with the Father through Jesus, with the Holy Spirit. So Jesus opened the way for you to have direct conversations with God the Father. He opened the veil so you can live beyond that, beyond that veil. He opened the way that the high priest could only come in behind that veil to, to um, put blood on the um, mercy seat once a year. And if they were, had sin on them, they just dropped dead and died. And in the New Testament, Jesus' blood covers the mercy seat. Now, what's really interesting that you've probably never heard preached before because, I don't know, why. In the Old Testament, you know how they used to sacrifice animals? Did you know there's not one scripture in the entire Bible that says the blood of animals forgave sin? It says that it deferred the judgment. Yes. What date did it defer the judgment until? 
What does that mean? That means that all of the thousands of years of the rebellion against God, you know, Israel, they basically, for you boys as well, as like the first people of God, the Jewish people, they were constantly worshipping idols and then worshipping God, and it was like this, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. So it was pretty hectic. It was like they were coming and going as they needed God and just walking away to their own lives. Now, the interesting thing about that is all God's stored up wrath couldn't actually be deleted by the blood of animals. All it ever did was defer the wrath of the Father. Defer the wrath of the Father. It says that Jesus, the, before, before his name is Jesus, the Messiah, it says he will tread the winepress of Almighty God. What is a winepress? It's when people crush grapes, or they probably even have a wooden device that crushes them, if not, if not the feet. Crush, crush, crush. Now it says that Jesus tread the winepress of God's wrath. Now what's amazing about that is it wasn't until Christ that they could actually have all those sins completely deleted as though they never happened. That means Jesus Christ was the saviour of the entire Old Testament. Because he was the one that eventually paid the price. Wow. Did you know that Jesus, after he died, he went in and actually rescued the saints in person? It says that some of them rose from the dead in front of people. Death couldn't hold him. An interesting note is back then, when you were 30 years old, you would actually save up money and buy a tomb because everyone knew their time was limited. You know Jesus never did buy a tomb? <laughs> he never did. In Isaiah it says he was buried like a rich man. It's a prophecy from 700 years before Christ. You know why it says that? Because he borrowed the grave of a rich man. He didn't even buy his own. Do you know why Jesus never bought his own grave? He was fully aware who he was and he knew that death couldn't hold him and he knew that the grave couldn't hold him. Jesus, everywhere he went, had the shadow of the Holy Spirit upon him. It says that the Holy Spirit didn't just live inside Jesus. It says that the Holy Spirit rested upon him. Right? His connection to the Father was always through the Holy Spirit. So when the Father said, go to the wilderness... It was actually the Holy Spirit that led Jesus into the wilderness. So he was led by the Spirit in contact with the Father through the Spirit. That's like us. Jesus was actually the, the role model of the normal Christian life. Jesus Christ, his life, is your perfect theology. Now here's an interesting one. Jesus taught his followers to forgive people 77 times 7. The, the human said... What about seven? Isn't that enough? So I've seen churches that forgive once and then they go, look, we forgave that person once and never doing it again. <laughs> that person, one strike, you're out, go on, never see you again. The guy in the Bible was nicer than some churches. He said, I'll forgive seven times. That's pretty gracious. I thought he was a pretty gracious bloke. Jesus says, no, 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 no. Forget that. 77 times seven. Trust me, I'm Asians. I know how poor they are. You need it. <laughs> You're going to need a lot of grace, a lot of grace, because they are going to make a mistake after a mistake and it's going to hurt you, and you're going to need a lot of grace. Now, this is interesting, because Jesus taught radical forgiveness. Now, this is my question to you. Do you think Jesus would teach you to forgive someone 77 times 7 and not be prepared to do it himself? Why would he teach you to do something he doesn't do himself? The answer is he wouldn't, and he never... He never did. He has radical love and radical grace. Judgment and legalism pushes people away. Right? I don't want to be soft on sin, but do you know the whole world of homosexuals feels judged, condemned, and rejected by the church? Judged, condemned, and rejected. Because they're reading things on Facebook saying, You can't be gay and be a Christian. And they're all getting angry and angry and angry. Wow, you know what Jesus did when he called the woman in the act of adultery? Like literally she was caught in the act of adultery? She should have been stoned. You know what Jesus said? I don't condemn you. I don't judge you. And look, your accusers have left. That's wrong. You now go your way. You know, don't keep doing it, right? Sin no more. He had so much grace, right? And it says that we are to take on that attitude, the grace. We are, it says we are ministers of reconciliation. Now why this is so important is because Jesus says the Gentiles, meaning the nations, 
they blaspheme my name because I have been misrepresented by those who do not even know me. Is Jesus' name a swear word on the earth today? It is, because he's still misrepresented by people who claim to be high priests who don't know him and have never even met him. Wow, so we think, oh, that person said the gospel and they rejected it. Do you know sometimes the gospel they rejected was coming from a Pharisee and not from a believer who had the Holy Spirit and didn't come in love? And it needs to come from a believer who's filled with the Holy Spirit? You can hear the gospel 20 times from people who don't have the Holy Spirit and you won't get saved because it's the Holy Spirit who broods over the Word waiting to perform it. How did Lydia get saved in the Bible? It says that Paul preached the gospel, but it says the Holy Spirit of God opened the heart of Lydia so she could receive the message. I'll give you a, you know, basically what I'm saying here is if Paul didn't have the Holy Spirit on him and in him, I can tell you right now, the heart of Lydia would not have been opened up and she would not have got saved. I was, I was talking to a guy on the street about Jesus. He goes, you know what? I've said no to about 11 people that have talked to me about Jesus because he's living on the street. He goes, I don't know what's different about this situation, but I want to say yes. Well, I think I know what was different. It says it's the anointing of, of the Holy Spirit, the anointing of God, the Christos, the Holy Spirit on you. That is what breaks the yoke of the enemy. Now, picture the yoke as being a spiritual darkness and a spiritual blindness around someone. Your words are going to fall on deaf ears unless the Holy Spirit is there to open them. So, in order for people to get saved through your life, the yoke of the enemy, the darkness that blinds them, needs to be literally supernaturally opened by the Holy Spirit, and they need to be born again also by the Holy Spirit. So, we've got Christians out there that have never met Jesus, that have never been filled with the Holy Spirit, that actually have doctrines that teach against the Holy Spirit, right? Doctrines of severe unbelief, and then we wonder why the people aren't getting saved. Do you know sinners loved Jesus? You name it. Gang, gang members, like prostitutes, they, do you know every single one of them loved Jesus Christ? We are supposed to have that reputation. Sinners that love you because you're manifesting Jesus. If sinners don't want to be near you, the bad news is you're not manifesting Jesus. Because if you were manifesting Jesus, they would be drawn to you and they would feel loved and they wouldn't feel condemned. Oh, but what if they stay in their sin for five years? Well, the good news is you don't have to worry about that because it says the Holy Spirit was sent to convict the world. The Holy Spirit was consent. When is it our job to take the Holy Spirit's role to convict the world of their sin? Wow, that's, that's a horrible horrible thing right there, people convicting other people of sin. I wrote on someone's Facebook page recently, they said, you can't be a Christian and be gay. Well, that's fine. But since when is it our job to tell people that? When the Holy Spirit comes upon someone who's struggling, guess what? Things shift. I went to um, a church in Sydney with my sister who doesn't go to church, right? And it was really interesting. She comes home from church, and it was just a normal little church, nothing super special looks in the mirror and she goes, oh, oh my gosh, I just saw myself as beautiful for the first time. Now can anybody guess why that happened? Because the fact that she saw herself as ugly was because of a spiritual deception. Now the spiritual deception broke when she came into the presence of the anointing of God. Wow, people are actually saved by the Holy Spirit on you. Do you know how many people come to Christ at like Marvin that decided to believe in Jesus, not because of words, but because of the tangible presence of the Holy Spirit he felt come upon him eight months ago in a Mennonite community? Got radically saved. The other day his hands are covered in diamond dust. I don't know where it came from, maybe heaven, maybe an angel. But he was excited and he came into my room, knocked on the door, goes, look at my hands, are covered in something, some unknown heavenly substance. Well, everyone finds it hard to believe right up until you see it. And then you go, well, I can't really explain it, can you? I don't think he's, he's gone into his bag and bought glitter and glued it on and stuck it in the bag. Because he's not that kind of guy. Now, I just want to talk about the glory of God. Surrounding God, wherever he is, is a thing called his glory. Now, why this is a message that's important is because, yes, it's in the Bible, the Logos Word of God in the Greek, but the Rainbow Word of God is the spoken Word of God. And I had, I had God speak to me about what we're talking about right now. 
So now I'm not just preaching to you the Logos word, I'm actually preaching the Rhema in connection with the Logos, which obviously gives the word more power, right? Now, I had a dream, and I was standing in a place that could have been heaven, or it could have been just a nice place. And I see this angel just kind of just hovering up in the air, and I'm like, this is awesome. This is going to be fun. What's going to happen here? And it's, it is a dream. I'm not, I'm not saying I'm walking around heaven. I'm in a dream. I'm asleep in my bed. I like to be honest about that too, by the way. I don't like it when preachers say, I went to heaven, but really they had a dream. I don't like that. I like to be exactly honest and tell you exactly what happened and how it happened. If, if the Holy Spirit wants to lift me up and take me to heaven in the flesh, right, then he will do that. But if he just wants to speak to you through a dream, he spoke to Joseph through a dream. You know, Gabriel, Gabriel the angel visited him in a dream. Gabriel didn't run around saying, I went to heaven, I saw an angel, ah, everyone needs to buy my CD so you can learn how to also see angels in heaven. And then, get, and then, <laughs> and then hire a marketing manager to market that book all around the world. Right? So anyway, in this dream, there's this huge angel, and I'm looking up and I'm thinking, this is incredible. And the first question, I, I got the feeling that this angel was going to answer literally any question in the world that I asked. So this is what I chose to say. How is this possible that I'm here? Probably could have thought better things to say, but anyway. This angel said, anything is possible in the glory of the Lord. And the mountains and the valleys shook for as far as the eye could see, literally shook and echoed and reverberated with that message. And I went, okay, I didn't know what the glory meant. I just thought, like, that's anything's possible with God, right? Sure, fair enough. Christian 101. But the word glory came up. What's his glory? Well, when Moses went up to the mountain, he invited people to come with him. He said, hey guys, I'm just going to meet God on the top of the mountain. See those huge flashing lightnings and that huge like wind of like hurricane fire? I'm going to go stand in it. Do you guys want to come with me? <laughs> Guess what people said? No. You go, buddy. <laughs> Good luck. Let us know if you live. They thought we are going to drop dead. Now the reason why I think he, he climbed the hill is because it says in the Bible, who will ascend the hill of the Lord? Him with clean hands and a pure heart. I think he knew he was pretty right standing with God. And I think the others knew that they weren't. And they're like, Moses, you're a pretty good bloke. You'll be right. Us? I don't know. We might get struck down. Anyway, the thing is, they actually probably would not have been struck down, but they missed out on the glory. That's right. Moses goes up, right? Now, this, there's another important detail here. The fact that Moses goes up and the others don't tells me that Moses has a relationship with God that's deeper than the others. That's right. And that Moses knows that God's not going to kill him because he knows God loves him. That's right. Now, knowing God loves you is huge. I was talking to the guys today and I said to them, do you know how John the disciple actually defined who he was? Because he defined himself. He said, I'm the one that Jesus loves. And in that, he also meant, I'm the one that Jesus chose, and Jesus rescued, and Jesus loved, and Jesus picked me. He was so excited. He used to sleep on Jesus' chest at night. And they'd all just huddle around a fire. Wow, that's not a very religious life. Waking up in the morning next to Jesus and going, I wonder if we're going to see the dead raised, the sick healed, the blind eyes open, demons cast out, or something totally new, like him telling the weather to just calm down. Maybe we're going to walk on water. Every day was an exciting adventure following Jesus, and that was never supposed to change. When Jesus said, make disciples, the disciples listened to that, and they thought, he wants us to do exactly what he did for us to other people. That went for 300 years until Constantine turned it into an institutionalized, controlled religion and used it for political gain, because there was two million Christians in Rome at that time. Where did I find that out? <laughs> He just told me. So back to my story on Moses, where that was actually the point, before I took the rabbit trail. Some of those rabbit trails have revelation in them. Now uh, Moses goes to the top. Now the, the glory of God is contagious. So when he stands in the presence of the glory of God, it gets on him and he carries it. His face is glowing with golden light. Now, one of the reasons people didn't want him to show his face, one of the reasons that's not clearly written there is because when the glory of God is around, you kind of feel a bit convicted. You can actually feel the glory. It feels holy and you're like, whoa, 
man, don't come so close with that golden face. <laughs> apparently in the original language, apparently, I don't know if this is true, but it says that there was flashes of, of lightning coming off his face. Someone told me that in the original language. You have to study that for yourself and find out if that's correct. Probably is. So um, the interesting thing about the glory, I'm just going to read a tiny bit out of Luke about shepherds in the field. Some people have already heard me mention this. You know, the shepherds that are standing around in the field, just hanging out, just looking after the sheep. And I heard this. <coughs> The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. For the reason the Holy Offspring shall be called the Son of God. So, you know, Mary's finding out that she's to carry Jesus. Okay, here it is. The shepherds. An angel of the Lord suddenly stood before the shepherds, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. Now, they were frightened not just because they saw angels of the Lord appear. They were also frightened because they could feel the glory of God coming off the angels because they had spent time in the presence of God. Do you know there's stories in revival history where people spent so much time in the presence of God that their face was radiating with glory? There was one guy that I happened to who I can't remember his name, I don't know if you can, and he literally just walked into government rooms and said, you need to receive Christ because he's real, and the entire government got saved, and then he went into judges and lawyers' firms, and they all got saved. It started a huge revival in like South Africa or somewhere. The glory of God is contagious. When you spend time in the throne room of God, you're not going to come back the same. That's right. You're not going to come back the same. You're going to come back. When you get baptized in the Holy Spirit with fire, you will actually be fully immersed. Baptizo means full immersion in the tangible presence of God's very character and nature. Now when that covers you and soaks you, you start to smell a bit more like Jesus, if not completely smelling like Jesus. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, um, the glory of the Lord and the angels. The angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of a great joy which shall be for all the people. Now, when you're telling someone who doesn't believe in God about Jesus, you can quote the scripture. The angel said, I have good news of a great joy which shall be for all the people. That's powerful. This is a great joy for all the people. For today, in the city of David, there has been born a Saviour, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes, lying in a manger. Talk about being in the right place at the right time, in history and in location. Checking out a sheep. And suddenly appeared with the angel an entire multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. With men who he is pleased? The Father is pleased? Did you know your daddy, your father in heaven, your perfect father, so loved you, he was the one, your daddy, Father God. Father God was the one who actually came up with the plan and sent Jesus Christ into the world to save the world. For God, for God who? For God the Father, Elohim, so loved the world. He was the one who sent Yeshua into the world to rescue you. And it says that, do you know you were the joy set before him? Jesus said, I'm doing this for the joy that's set before me. You were the joy set before him. The Bible calls you his treasured possession. Do you let your heart feel, do you actually let that sink into your heart, in your head, your heart, that you are his treasure? He looks at you with great joy and he is pleased. And you know what? We think, but I've made 2,684 mistakes so he couldn't possibly love me. Do you have any idea how powerful the blood of Jesus actually is? You know that song, What Can Wash Away My Sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Did you know the blood of Jesus doesn't only forgive sin, it actually heals you? It heals you. By His stripes we are healed. The blood of Jesus heals you. He paid, he paid a lot of a great high price for your healing. 
Your healing was already paid for. It says Jesus went about healing everyone who was oppressed by the devil. When you get a revelation that every trace of sickness, every single trace of pain in your body is an oppression by the devil, that's when you realize that as a believer filled with the Holy Spirit, you have authority over every work of the devil. Amen. Now, I know many Christians, in fact, the vast majority say this, Oh, Lord Jesus, send revival, send your Holy Spirit sovereignly to fall on the land. Lord Jesus, you know, go out and save the souls, Lord, and Lord, go out and heal the sick, and Lord, cast out those demons. Lord, just cast out that principality. <laughs> cast it out, Lord. What would, you, what would your boss say to you if he paid you a wage to do a job and you came to him and told him to do the job he hired you to do? Do you know the Bible says you are the ones commissioned to bind the evil spirits? Go out, heal the sick, cast out demons. He's commissioned you to heal the sick. Send revival. Jesus said, don't even pray that. You know what he says? Pray for laborers. Pray for people that aren't scared of a little bit of hard work. Why are you praying for revival when you could be praying for laborers? Or you could even be a laborer. Yeah. Because it takes effort. It takes effort. Most revivals, most revivals happened when people got so on fire for God that they would walk up to people. They lost the fear of man. Right? They lost the fear of man. They walk up to people and say, I've got the best news for you you've ever heard in your entire life. The creator of the universe wants to not only give you a brand new start of life, he wants to forgive you of every wrong thing you've ever done, but he also wants to fill you with his very presence. Now, not even Adam and Eve in the garden are filled with the presence of God, and not even the angels are filled with the Holy Spirit. But you will be given a great honor to carry the presence of the Holy Spirit. But it gets better. If he hasn't given you his son, if he has given you his most treasured possession, would he not give you everything else as well? Wow, if he's given you his most treasured possession, he will give you every other thing too. And that's called your inheritance. And if you're a son or a daughter of the Most High God, guess what? That comes as an inheritance. Your father has a treasure, an inheritance with your name on it for you. An inheritance. Wow, what's that look like? Well, firstly, you become grafted into his family and you become a son, a son of the Most High. Looks like a prince or a princess. You carry royalty. Chris Belgian writes a book, The Supernatural Ways of Royalty. We have to learn new ways. Wow, that's amazing. It's almost too good to be true. I, know, I, I just said exactly those words to a guy from Brazil, and literally tears started streaming down his face. He hasn't heard that before. No one's, no one's sharing a gospel that God wants to come and live inside of you. I mean, I've been out in the streets talking to people about Christ for over 10 years, and I'll tell you, every time I tell them the Holy Spirit of God wants to make them the temple and fill them and live inside of them and be your best friend, they've never heard it before. Never. No one's ever, ever, ever in their whole life told them that God wants to live inside of them and be their best friend and give them a brand new start of life. A brand new start of life. They're like, oh, never heard that before. Okay, I'll, I'll do it. I'll receive Christ. I'm like, sometimes they're just like, Oh, that's amazing. Yes, I've been praying and asking God to reveal himself. I'm so glad that you came past today and your jaw drops and you're like, are you serious? Are you telling me that literally any Christian could have come up and said 10 words and you're like, yes, let's do it. Boom. Wow. I'm like, do you have any friends that think like you? <laughs> this was too easy. It wasn't even fair. I was on the beach one day and I was just singing some Christian songs and the girl goes, Oh, you got a nice, that's an nice song. Oh, yeah? Yep, cool. And I said to her, you know, you know, God loves you so much and he wants to give you a brand new start at life and he wants to forgive you of everything wrong you've done and then fill you with his spirit. You can prophesy them into the kingdom. She just started to cry because the Holy Spirit came upon her and said, yeah, that's true. Here's my presence to prove it. And she got saved, and then a friend got saved, and she, she was the one that said, I, I was praying to God to find who, out who it was that was her. Another time I was walking down the beach, and I walked up to a couple, I didn't know I'm from a bar of soap, and I said, hey, how you going guys, having a fun night? They're not even from where I live, they're, they're tourists from out of town. If, if they think I'm ridiculous and a fool, well, I'm only going to lose a bit of pride, and then I'll just go home and I'll never see them again. What is the matter? 
If you're never going to see anyone again, what does it matter what they think of you? Just so much freedom when you know you're never going to see them again. <laughs> they, could think, they could think you're anything. So I just walked up to them and I said, hey, we're actually crying on the beach. Do you guys, do you guys want to just join us? They didn't say no. If they said no, I wasn't going to push the issue. I was going to say, all right, have a good night. But they said yes. I couldn't believe it. I just walked up to two random people and said, do you want to pray with us? And they said yes. This is weird. So we sit down on the beach and I can't believe they said yes. What do I do now? <laughs> So we sit on the beach and we all hold hands in a little circle. And we said, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Lord, just touch them with your tangible presence. Suddenly, tears streaming down both their faces. Holy Spirit touched their heart and they felt love. Do you know when the Holy Spirit's presence comes upon someone? They don't just know He loves them, their heart can feel agape love flowing into it. And they just cry. When you feel overwhelming love at a wedding, what happens? You just cry. You can't help it because you are over brimming, overflowing with love and you just cry. So that's pretty cool. It's exciting. So basically the, the, the goal here is if we can get everyone so filled with the fire of the Holy Spirit, so free from the fear of man, which the Old Testament says is a snare. A snare is like an animal trap. It will keep you completely still and you won't be able to move anywhere. The fear of man is a snare. Right. You've got to lose that thing straight up. Amen. Just lose it. Just I don't care what people think anymore. Let's just all pray that. Lord Jesus, I thank you. I thank you so much that I'm living for an audience of one. And it doesn't matter what anybody thinks about me. And I I re rebuke the fear of man. I rebuke the fear of man. Off my life. And I choose to walk in total freedom. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now people will have testimonies just from that little bit of prayer. There'll be people that come back here tomorrow and say, It worked! It worked! I stopped caring what people think, so I just told them the truth. And they got saved. Wow. Some will, some won't, but there's always someone waiting. You know, the, the, the gospel of the, the parable of the, the um, sower, parable of the sower, Jesus teaches that when you preach the gospel, right, because he fully expected every single follower of his to preach the gospel, that's why he said it. When you do this, automatically presuming you will, it'll be like throwing seed all over the ground, okay? The, the word of God, the truth of the crucifixion, everything that they need to get saved. This is like seed. He said, then there's four different ways people are probably going to respond to your seed, the word of God. Now, he says, one group of people will land on the stony ground. Now, in, back in those farming days, that was near the fence. There was a lot of stony ground. The fence was made out of usually like just rocks piled up. And that was the stony soil. And the farmers knew that if that seed accidentally fell there, that it wasn't going to, it wasn't going to grow at all. So some people, you'll tell them everything they need to know to get saved. Nothing will happen because they're stony ground. They're not the right soil. And the birds of the air, which are evil spirits, will come and they will take away anything that was sown. And it will be like it never happened. I've actually seen that, where I've told someone all about God, all about dreams I had, and this mate of mine, and he goes, after 45 minutes of testimonies, he goes, what did you just say? I just blanked out. I just missed every single word you said. 45 minutes of talking, he goes, I, don't, I missed every single word you said. I blanked out. That's a good example of stony ground. There's another group of people. Now, the good thing is you don't have to... People don't always stay in these sections, okay? If you've got a brother or sister who's in that section, they don't have to live there for the rest of their life. You can add water to that soil and add a little bit of nutrients and some fertilizer, and you can... Have that thing sprout up. That's right. Now the other group of people it talks about, it says that it'll grow up for a little while. So word of God, they get saved, they become a Christian, but it says that they have no root, they have no death within themselves. So it's like a person who's got a very shallow nature. And there's nothing in them for this plant to take root. These kind of people, it says, when it grows, if anything comes along that they don't like, like scripture, they read scripture, they decide they don't like or there's persecution, 
from atheists that think they're smarter than you, or whatever. They go to university and learn about the theory of evolution, right? It says that these people, when anything comes that they don't like, they'll just quit. The little thing that they have, it just goes. The next group of people, and we're getting a little bit better here, the next group of people, when you tell them about Jesus, what will happen is, it will grow up quite well. They'll be a strong Christian. But something will choke them. What is it? The lies and the deceits of the world. Not the devil. Just, just normal life. When Jesus says, do not conform to the patterns of this world, he's talking about normal life. He says, the cares of this world. How much money have I got in the bank? Is it enough money? That's often just a manifestation of an orphan spirit that doesn't know that they're a son or a daughter. I don't have enough in my pockets to store up for the winter because my God's not my provider. My job is my provider. So, you know, with, with this kind of person, it says when the lies and the deceits choke them, it says that their genuine faith is completely constricted by the things of this world and they are choked. If you knew how many Christians in the world are in that category, you would be absolutely shocked. Absolutely shocked and appalled. I would say a huge portion of Christians around the world are genuine Christians. They love Jesus, they believe the Bible, they've probably been in Bible college, but they're so gripped by the cares of this world that genuine faith is being choked. Now, the interesting thing is I used to be in that category. And I'm not in it anymore. And do you know how I got out of it? Because God sent a dream to warn me. And in the dream, I saw heaven coming down. I saw people running up the staircase, the narrow staircase, because it says broad is the way that leads to destruction. Only narrow is the way that actually leads to heaven and Jesus. And people were running up the staircases, you know, and they were going straight up to the clouds and heaven. And in the dream, I was wrapped in uh, like a vine with huge spikes. And I didn't know what it was in the dream. I thought, this is really weird. Why would God send a vine to take me to heaven? Now, in this dream, the vine lifted me up in the air. Up, 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 up. And it was taking me closer to the clouds. Now, I immediately presumed the vine was taking me to heaven. Do you know these Christians that are in this boat that are constricted by the lies and the deceits of this world? They are convinced that they are on their way to heaven. They don't even realize that the cares of this world has actually choked their genuine faith. I thought I was going to heaven. I said, Jesus, it's weird that God would send a vine to lift me to heaven with huge spikes this long. Well, that's not where it was going. I saw a mouth open up and a tunnel kilometers into the ground. When the mouth opened up, down the bottom of that thing was a lake of fire. And just to scare me, just enough to get me to get out of this category, God shows me me being dropped. And before I drop, a guy looks up at me and he goes, he's not going to heaven, he's going to the other place. And the way he said it, oh, he's going to the other place. It was like great fear came upon me. And you cannot imagine how scary that was. I woke up. We call that in, in the prophetic world, we call that a morning dream. God is giving you a shocking dream to say, Wake up, wake up. If you don't change what you're doing, this is going to be you. Wake up. And so I was only young at the time, and I had not even read the scripture of that, the parable of the soul. I didn't even know it. So God showed me something that's scripturally true that I didn't even know was in the Bible. And so at the time, I did have this love of money thing where I look at, I look at buildings and cars and get all excited and be like, wow, I really want that thing. You know, the love of money, it was really there. After this dream, when I repented of that and I threw money into an offering, I remember struggling trying to put it in. It was only fifty dollars, and I was struggling. I'm like, I've got to put this in the bucket, and I'm like, What are you doing? Let go. And as soon as I dropped that fifty dollars in the offering, because I'd only been giving ten, twenty, you know, twenty-five, I had never given fifty in an offering. When I dropped it into the offering, the entire world that I saw shifted. Everything shifted. Instead of working in, walking into my job, which was in one of the most prestigious buildings and having a fancy financial planning office, I walked in there and instead of going, look at me, I'm a financial advisor with a fancy office, very fancy office. I walked into work it's the next day and I went, what a sad glass building full of all these zombies that think that, that life's good, but they're actually not even going to heaven and they're spiritually dead. The way I saw the whole world shifted just like that. I went from category vines wrapping me up to category 
flourishing. Now the fourth category, now that is the one you want to be in. In the fourth category, it says that not only will you grow up so strong, that, that when that tree grows strong, you will have unshakable faith. You will be so big and so strong, like a cedar of Lebanon planted by a stream, that when a typhoon comes, when people die around you, when sickness is coming, when, when a tornado comes, and you, you think everyone thinks all hope is lost, you are unshaken because you are deeply rooted in Christ. And you have passed your anchor beyond the day of. And your anchor is in Christ. Honestly, your anchor is not even in this book. Your anchor is literally in Christ. All right? And you are anchored yourself there and you have unshakable faith. Now, if you're not at that level, the good news is you can be very short in you can get to a level where you're unshakable and nothing wavers you at all. It's an amazing place to be because fear goes. You don't have fear. What's there to fear? You can't be offended. It's impossible to be offended because you're just so, I don't care what you think. Why would I care what you think? Zero offense. So very interesting. So um, that scripture actually says that this person who grows up like that that will actually inspire 20, 40, 100 times the return. Now, if you hear a preacher preach that exact scripture from that context of people getting saved and growing in faith, if you hear any preacher put that into a financial point of view, and they say that in your business you will have 160, 20 fold, 100 fold, firstly, they're appealing to your fleshly carnal nature. Secondly, they've just quoted Jesus Christ, but instead of being the gospel to salvation, they put it in a financial package. What's that called? It's called a different version. A different version of what Jesus taught. What's another name for a different version? It is a perversion of the gospel. Now, there is more perversion of the gospel than pure gospel. I was in a house with Dan C. McLean and this young man. It could be him. I can't really tell which one's which. <laughs> Honestly, it was actually him. And I said, some of the things I'm teaching tonight are going to sound very different than what you've been taught. The reason is, I'm preaching the gospel that was preached 2,000 years ago as Jesus taught it, not the gospel you've been hearing over the last 20 years. So people go, no, you're wrong, that's wrong, because they've been taught for 20 years that that, God, that message is about money. But it's not, it's about salvation. And the hundredfold return, that's a hundred souls growing in faith. So it's back to that. So this young lady here is going to look in her face like she's going, Oh my gosh, I've never heard the gospel preached 100% as it says it, with no agenda. Oh, where is this? Like, I've been looking on every channel of God TV and I haven't found it yet. What's interesting is that we're getting people like, like that are like, Oh, this is so interesting. What kind of gospel is this? Well, it's actually the one Jesus taught. It just hasn't been taught in about 40 years. People are like, I've never heard this teaching. Yeah, it's just interesting, but it hasn't really been taught for 40 years, but it's actually in the Bible. Now the thing is, in the Bible, if you're a preacher and you, you pervert the word, it says, woe to you who does not preach the whole Bible. Right. If, if you're honestly, I'm not going to ever name names, but if you're listening to people who don't preach the whole gospel, including sin and repentance and the blood of Jesus, and they refuse to talk about the blood of Jesus, I'm going to tell you, don't fear your carnal nature. Don't fear anything that excites your fleshly carnal nature. Don't listen to it because they're feeding the wrong one. You want to listen to, why do you think I listen to Bill Johnson all the time? He's feeding my spirit. He's talking about signs and wonders and miracles and healings and Jesus and becoming Jesus and manifesting the Holy Spirit. I listen to Bill Johnson for about three years, nearly every night. I just get it on YouTube and hit play, put it next to my ear and go to bed. And I'm just like, oh, Holy Spirit, why are you in my room? <laughs> Hello. And I literally feel the waves of his presence just wash over me. You know, I've got a brother who's come really on fire for God. And uh, we used to sit around the house and I used to go, hey, let's play the dove game. And the dove game was a game that we sort of made up, which was do everything and anything that will attract the tangible presence of the Holy Spirit into the room so we can feel it. And so we open up books that were Holy Spirit inspired. And no joke, I'd be reading like a book like a Bill Johnson book, and I would literally feel the Holy Spirit just come upon me and I'd go, oh, that's it, hello, where have you been? <laughs> Hiding. And then um, I would pick up, a, you know, like a carnal book, and I'd read it, no Holy Spirit. He won't brood over something that's not true. I, I, I want to give you a real example of truth versus, um, you know, 
not to. Um, I was on the, on the beach in the Gold Coast and I text messaged a whole bunch of people from different churches, right? Doesn't, I don't care about them, what denomination people are from. Irrelevant to me, right? And I used to just go, come to this meeting, we're just going to worship Jesus on the beach. There's no preaching, in fact, we're not doing anything about worship. So you know what, only the hungry ones came. All the ones that are kind of like mediocre Christians, well, I'm not going to go to a cold beach and sing a guitar song. So all the hungry ones that are like, yeah, that's a great idea, let's worship Jesus on the beach. They were the ones who came out. Now, who knows if the Holy Spirit of God is attracted to spiritual hunger? So much so, he spoke to me and said, if you can get the people in the room to increase their spiritual hunger, I will actually increase the anointing. And if you can get, if you get the people in the room to double their spiritual hunger, he said, I'll even double the anointing. Well, what does double the anointing look like? Well, it looks like Azusa Street. <laughs> it looks just a little bit like Wales, the Welsh Revival. You know, my grandma was saved because her, her father was in the Welsh Revival. You know, my, my grandma never let the fire of the Welsh Revival go out. She kept it right up until she died. And it looked like it was going to end there. And I said, Grandma, I think I'll take that. I think the message that you've been sharing before you die, I think, I think I want to share that. So before she died, me and my friends were all singing in a circle, Amazing Grace. You know, she loved it. Grandma got to see her grandson, who was a backslidden party boy. She got to see him, you know, get saved before she went. And so I caught that fire. And so my faithful grandmother never let the Welsh Revival fires burn out in her. She kept fanning him, she kept fanning him. And I thank her that she gave it to me. Because Ed and Roberts is in heaven going, it hasn't gone out. It hasn't, it hasn't gone out. There's like five people that kept it burning. Look, it's going, it's going, go, 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 go. It says there's a great cloud of witnesses yeah. looking on the earth. There's a great cloud of witnesses. The fire of the Holy Spirit that fell on that Pentecost, that fell in Wales, is here tonight. When I was prayed for by this African prophet, I felt hot flames, hot flames, burning, burning hot inside my chest. I hit the deck, I'm laying on the ground, and I can feel hot fire burning. Wow, what's this? Well, it's all through the Bible. It's called the fire of the Holy Spirit. There are 700 references to heavenly fire. 700 references. People read them and go, ooh, fire. That sounds like condemnation. Because they don't know. On the day of Pentecost, the fire that fell was not bad fire, it was God. It was God. Some of those scriptures that say blood and fire and pillars of smoke, do you know some of those scriptures are talking about the atoning sacrifice of the blood of Jesus? Some of those scriptures are talking about the fire of the Holy Spirit that will fall to the end times. During the tribulation, there will be great revivals. Wow. Some people misquoted that scripture and thought it meant there's going to be wars. Where it says the army is the army of the Lord. It doesn't say the army is the army of the devil. So this, this army that was prophesied about in Job... This army is being raised up right now. And there hasn't been a generation like it. There literally hasn't been a generation like it. And every like prophet that you can talk to at the moment is aware of it. Like you look at Todd White, he's, he's crazy, right? He's awesome. There's people like Todd White in every country in the world. Some of them just haven't really been noticed yet. Jesus? Where do you want to go from here? <laughs> 9.15. Who wants to keep going and preaching? Who wants to move to Holy Spirit, fire, and miracles? <laughs> <laughs> We've had enough of those persuasive words, buddy. We love you. No, that's right. Um, I was praying about what to preach at a certain church, and uh, God spoke to me and said, They don't want a message. They don't want one. And I prayed again, and He goes, I told you, they don't want a message. They want a demonstration. That's pretty cool. Amen. We can we can finish any last bit uh, tomorrow morning, Sunday morning. What time is Sunday morning for the service? Eleven.